All right. Okay. Okay, convene an open session via Zoom. Um, uh, if you call this meeting to order um, and read the meeting script. Script for remotely conducted open meetings. Good morning. This open meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee is convening by video conference pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. All supporting materials have been provided. Members of this body are available on the town's website, otherwise, unless otherwise noted. This meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that other people may be able to see you. Take, near, take care not to share your device's screen. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Use the raise the hand feature in Zoom in the reactions button down below um, to indicate that you'd like to offer a comment. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order they were raised. All questions should be directed to the chair. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to the Coastal Resilience Coordinator, Leah Hill, and request that they be used read into the meeting record. Her email is lhill at nantucket-ma.gov. Confirming member access. I am Peter Brace, Chair of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Okay. Sarah Boyce. Here. Gary Beller. Here. Doug Rose. Here. Kim Brain. Here. Jen Carberg. Here. Uh, let's see, we have Rachel Freeman. Okay, well, I know she's here. So, um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Leah Hill. Here. Okay. All right. So, finally, each. Vote taken. Oh, anticipated speakers. That'll be Trevor Johnson. Here. Okay. Finally, each vote taken in the meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. All right. Um, public comment. Does anyone have a comment? Um, a public comment that is not that has nothing to do with anything on, on the agenda. Okay, seeing none. Um, update and presentation on the downtown neighborhood flood barrier initial phase by Trevor Johnson, Arcadis Senior Resilience Planner, Bill Casey, Arcadis Project Manager, and Julie Conroy, Arcadis Senior Resilience Specialist. Okay, go ahead, Trevor. All right, thank you. Uh, let me just pull up the slides here. Make sure I'm sharing the right. Am I sharing which am I sharing the right screen or the wrong screen? Can somebody let me know? Now you are. Is it uh okay. it's right now. It's not it's not your whole computer screen, it's just your presentation. Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, very happy to be here. Great to see uh, some familiar faces. Um, my name is Trevor Johnson. For those that I haven't met, a uh, senior resilience planner with Arcadis. I've uh, been with the firm for uh, approaching five years now. Um, and pretty much for the duration of that time, I've been working uh, with or adjacent to Arcadis with my colleagues here or with uh, Nantucket. Um, with my colleagues here at Arcadis. Um, most uh, notably, I think I served as the project manager for the Coastal Resilience Plan, uh, which was uh, one of the foundational documents that led to this project we're here to talk about today. 
Uh, joined today by my colleagues, as uh, Peter noted, uh, Bill Casey, who's the uh, project manager uh, for this effort, uh, an engineer with uh, several decades of experience and brings uh, a lot of um, uh, experience working both on Nantucket and around the Commonwealth on, on design projects. Uh, Julie Conroy, who uh, recently joined Arcadis uh, four or so months ago, a senior resilience specialist, uh, and she'll introduce herself uh, in a moment when she uh, presents a portion of this presentation. Um, and then Michelle McDonald, who is uh, serving as a project uh, engineer um, and overall uh, sort of support staff for this for this effort. Um, so this uh, this study called the Feasibility Study and Design for a Flood Barrier in Nantucket's Historic Downtown Gateway. Um, this is uh, the next, the, the real purpose of this project is as the next phase of design for one of the key recommendations from the Coastal Resilience Plan for the downtown focus area, uh, which was a strategy uh, to mitigate flooding um, throughout the downtown area of Nantucket. Uh, as you all are well aware, Easy Street um, is uh, one of the lowest lying areas of the downtown and experiences substantial flooding uh, both today, which is projected to increase in the future with sea level rise, um, and increased precipitation. Uh, so it is uh, an urgent area for action both today and in the future. Um, this is a project that's funded by the Office of Coastal Zone Management. Um, it is a coastal resilience grant. It's funded for a two year period. So we'll be working um, kind of over two years and our tasks are divided across those two years. Um, and the, the years, uh, by the way, are, are fiscal years. So. Um, we're in year one now, which will conclude in June of, uh, of 2024, and year two will kick off in uh, July 1st of 2024. Um, and so we've just kind of launched this project. Uh, we had the kickoff a month or so ago and are underway. Um, we've undertaken a few of the early stage tax tasks and are excited to really be here today to kind of publicly launch the project and answer any uh, preliminary questions that, that the committee or the public may have. So agenda for today. Uh, we'll try to keep it brief, um, introduce our project team. Uh, we will uh, clarify our project site. Um, Julie will then uh, facilitate a short conversation about kind of our goals, your goals, and the success criteria that we want to co-develop with you. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more administratively about what you can expect in terms of our tasks, our deliverables, our schedule, some of the key milestones. Um, and in particular, how we're going to be engaging with this committee and the public and other stakeholders um, throughout this project, uh, and then we'll conclude with uh, just highlighting some of our, our next steps and key action items here in the early phase of this project. Um, and of course, happy to answer any questions uh, at the conclusion. Uh, so our project team, um, the as you can see at the top, Bill Casey, myself, and Michelle McDonald are here today, along with uh, Julie Conroy. Um, we represent kind of the key contacts that will be interfacing with you, um, this committee, and, and other key stakeholders throughout the project. Um, but we're supported by a really substantial bench of experts um, that we'll be drawing on at different periods throughout the project, depending on what we're working on, um, whether that's nature-based design, risk assessment, um, more infrastructural design, um, historic preservation considerations. Um, public realm design and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we have a, a, a you know, a, a large a group of experts that, that we'll be able to bring to the table, depending on, on what questions we need to answer. Uh, we also have three sub consultants who are working closely in an integrated manner with with Arcadis on this project. Um, Child's Engineering, which is a uh, waterfront structural engineering firm based in Massachusetts. Um, some of you may be aware they, the child's team was already out on Easy Street doing an assessment of the waterfront infrastructure there. Um, I believe it was at the very end of January. Uh, one architecture who was a member of our team for the Coastal Resilience Plan and, and really led a lot of our kind of public realm design work for the downtown area. So we're joined by them on this uh, project um, and they'll be uh, participating in the more sort of public facing and um, visual expressions and visual um, uh, elements of this project. And then uh, Woods Hole Group, uh, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, brings their coastal modeling expertise and uh, overall experience working in the Commonwealth on, on coastal uh, flood uh, risk management issues. Um, they're also working uh, closely with the land bank on a project on Washington Street. So they are um, bringing forth um, some of their uh, experiences on that project and ensuring that we have a consistent and coordinated approach across all the areas of the downtown that um, various entities are, are pursuing and advancing projects. 
So to clarify our project site, um, mention, I mentioned at the outset that you know the mission of this project is to develop a solution to alleviate flooding both in the near and long term along Easy Street from Steamboat Wharf to Old North, North Wharf. Um, what that means is what this project is going to be defining as we move forward. Um, the goal is to address the flooding, but we're going to be looking at a series of alternatives um, for how we do that in the most optimal manner while staying consistent with the values and principles and objectives that the Nantucket community has and, and that have been outlined through the CRP and, and other planning processes. Um, so we'll be looking at a series of alternatives to address the flooding. Um, some of the alternatives and solutions we might look at involve raising of bulkheads, um, raising the right of way along Easy Street, um, developing kind of hybrid approaches that might have a combination of different types of infrastructure, um, trying to integrate nature-based solutions and ecological design to the greatest extent possible. Um, but again, we'll be looking at the key consideration of how do we how do we address the flooding that's experienced most notably today and then over the long term. Um, another piece that we'll be considering here is, is access. It's um, we know that Steamboat Wharf is um, essential to the uh, livelihood of, of Nantucket um, and uh, flooding along Easy Street and Broad Street is a, is presents a significant risk to the community because it impacts access to and from Steamboat Wharf. Um, so as part of our, our project here, we'll be looking at the tie-ins and, and how we integrate the solution with um, protection of Broad Street and, and then ultimately long-term solutions to ensure um, access and um, use of, of Steamboat Wharf. Um, Throughout, um, this is again the early stage of the project. So throughout, we will be um, working with the with CRAC, other committees, and stakeholders, both on and off island, uh, to accomplish you know multiple goals. And so the next uh, section of this presentation, we've drafted some preliminary draft goals that we think will be relevant to the community, but we want to um, ensure that they're consistent with your uh, aspirations and objectives here. So. I'll turn it over to Julie, who's going to talk about that, and then also a little bit more about our schedule and, and scope. Thanks, Trevor. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm Julie Conroy. As Trevor had said, I'm the Senior Resilient Specialist at Arcadis for this uh, region. Um, I've only been at Arcadis for a little bit, uh, but I've been working in climate resilience throughout the area for the past 15 years. A um, lot of work on the Cape, um, Sandwich for instance, um, and that's where I'm from. I'm from C the Cape and uh, love Nantucket. So just wanted to put that out there before we got started. Um, the point in this presentation, we really wanted to pause and hear from you all because it's really important that we understand what your thoughts and, and as, aspirations and goals for the project are. And what we have shown here is what we heard uh, primarily towards the end of the development of the resilience plan um, that are a uh, reflection of the type of goals we wanna achieve for this particular site um, and all sites really. Um, and so we heard that um, stakeholders really need to be directly involved and in, we're very happy that we have your committee to, to really bounce a lot of ideas off of. Um, and that, you know, we understand that there are a lot of historic resources in this downtown area and we want to have the design complement and honor um, those resources, critical resources, but also find a way to enhance natural coastal resources because you know as you all know there is a lot of sort of you know beach area behind the bulkhead um, that was just shown on site um, there's obviously a lot of other aquatic uh, based resources and um, we want and generally like to work with nature wherever it's possible um, and we understand that there's also other issues that we need to explore with respect to um, uh, precipitation-based flooding um, and the interface between that and coastal flooding. Um, and obviously we want to forward this design so that there could be a, a direct implementation and funding available to get the project implemented. However, I wanna pause and kind of um, facilitate a discussion or at least receive some feedback from you all uh, to find out, you know, are, 
Are we on track with these goals? Is there anything else that we might be missing? Um, any particular viewpoint that you want to provide to us with respect to how we should um, consider alternatives for this project? So I'll stop for a moment and just open open up the floor. Um, and, I'll, and I'm gonna be taking some notes. So anyone have some thoughts on this? Um, Gary, go ahead. Well, um, these, these concepts are kind of like the umbrella concepts. Of course, the basic point of this entire uh, issue is that we need, we need the uh, success to show that Easy Street and the ferry will continue to be operated uh, it, it primarily for in the same amount of time that it's operating today. Maybe that's a little too granular for this type of a slide, but uh, I mean, the important thing is not that it makes people happy, but that it actually succeeds in uh, providing the ability uh, of the town uh, of Nantucket to continue receiving people and goods and uh, everything else that comes online uh, through, the, through the water uh, to the island. And that's why I said this is a little bit, I'm a little more granular when I look at what should be our, uh, our definition of success. The question is, uh, at the end of the day, will we still have 100 closures of Washington Street every year, uh, or will this uh, alleviate that problem? Great, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Joanna? Um, thanks. Uh, my question really is about the coordination with the Steamship Authority, because it, it seems to me that they would be a really important stakeholder in this project. And having sat with a couple of folks from the Steamship Authority board recently. I know that this is timely, um, the things that they're looking at. And I just wanted to hear a little bit from you about, you know, have you spoken with them? Ha are you sharing ideas with them? What is the collaboration? Peter, is it okay if I just go ahead and answer? Or I want to yeah. make sure I'm and I just want to take this opportunity um, so that all of our CADIS hears me. We have a two hour meeting and we have other agenda items. So just you guys keep that in mind. You take comments, but we can't, you know, anyway. Um, okay. Okay, so Understood. go ahead. Go ahead, Julie. Okay. The, sh the short answer is yes, absolutely. We will be engaging with them. Um, have not quite yet. Uh, the project just got started, but it's a very important point. Uh, Jen, go ahead. Thank you, Pete, um, and thank you, Julie, for this. I agree with what you know, was said before me. I think the thing I'd add to this is that, yes, we're looking at flooding and making sure we continue to have infrastructure access along this corridor. I think that's what, you know, a really primary um, goal of what this is going to be, but I think tied to it is also making sure that we still maintain public access. You know, this is an area that the public you know, moves through very, very regularly. And so maintaining something that's not just giving people access, but maintaining kind of that aesthetic of Nantucket. So I agree on honoring the historic piece, but even more than that, just honoring the experience of people that are coming to the island, moving through the island, making sure that that, you know, um, is still there. And I think, you know, working with the land bank, obviously that'll be maintained an important part of a goal here. Thank you, Jen. Um, Sarah? Thank you, uh, Pete. Um, so I'm really interested in, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative that you guys are here and getting input at this stage too. Um, this, my thought was, might be already folded into stakeholders and as well as the historic resources, but I just want to make a plug for the working waterfront. I know that this isn't necessarily part of the area, like this specific particular part of Easy Street, but I think the more input that we can get from the people who still make a living on the water in that area um, is really important just for the people that spend the most time. I know this isn't exactly that part of that area, but I just think um, 
the more people that are specifically invited to the table rather than just an open meeting is, is more helpful and you'll have more buy-in from the people that are down there all the time. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, and then I just wanna make a couple of comments. Um, jumping off of what Joanna said about the Steamship Authority, I mean, it, it, it just goes up, goes without saying that that we, Arcadis, got to work with the Steamship Authority, even though they're not going to be doing any of their renovations for another five to 10 years. But that's, you know, um, anyway, I just want to stress that that point. Um, and also, Arcadis needs to be aware that the, the Nantucket and Mattacut Harbors action plan um, update committee is currently updating the 2009 harbor plan and maybe you guys should tie in with our committee um, to see if there's any way we can help you or if there's anything that needs to go into our plan well, that's it that's very helpful thank you so much um, and also the the consultant on that plan is the urban harbors institute we know them well yes okay okay uh, Sarah, go ahead. Thanks, Pete. Um, something Pete just said, or I just was thinking about this. Um, because we have, you know, we had the Coastal Resiliency Plan, and then there's the update on the harbor plans right now. Um, and there's different consultants. Sometimes you guys are the same, sometimes different. Um, I just am thinking about the messaging to the general public. A lot of the stakeholder groups are really similar. And I know this is a very specific project, um, but I just want you guys to be thinking about that when we have like open meetings or comment periods. Um, maybe it's partly our job, maybe it's partly your job, but just to be really specific about what's being asked of people. Um, because like I, I mentioned the working waterfront, but if we just say you, you're welcome to comment on this, but it's, you know, it's really open and broad, there's gonna be a discussion about many other things that necessarily aren't necessarily pertinent to this particular project. So I think you probably have already thought of this, but just being really specific in what the ask is, uh, whether it's specific questions or to comment on very specific things. Um, and I think because this is happening at the same time as the Harbor Plan, um, just being really specific about the goals and projects when we're asking for public comment, because we want that public comment, but we want it to be targeted and meaningful to the project. So just that was, whether or not that's pertinent now, it just um, came to mind. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, anyone else on the board? Sorry, the committee. Okay, back to our Cadis. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I know you, you, in the interest of time, I'll go through these next slides quickly. This is just an overview of the tasks and uh, particular deliverables that you can expect um, that we will work with you directly on um, the, you know, existing conditions and, and flood assessment, as Trevor had mentioned, is, has started. Um, but we really are looking uh, for any information that you have. You're obviously experts in um, the downtown area. And if there are some uh, data, points of data, reports, anything, um, we're working obviously directly with Leah on that. Um, but certainly the committee um, should feel free to weigh in. Um, you know, and the design alternatives will happen. I want to skip to the community and stakeholder engagement because this is going to occur throughout the project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But um, in terms of, you know, things that have started, it's really, you know, the first and the third task. Um, clearly, you know, what we'll need to do from the assessment of all sorts of existing conditions, natural uh, infrastructure, historic, everything that was mentioned. Um, we'll then move forward into coming up with some conceptual illustrations that will really um, help with engagement so people can see the type of designs that are options and then have a selection process to determine what is the most uh, appropriate uh, design for, for the area. Um, and then, of course, we will we'll move into some uh, preliminary designs, um, really starting to hone in on that site and the solution that resonates the most with the community. 
And of course, this is all based on um, flood assessment work that has already been done by the Woods Hole Group, but they will be um, doing a deeper dive, let's say, into the uh, flood regime for the area so we understand really what is needed, what our options are. Um, Trevor, next slide. Thank you. And so this is a little bit of an aggressive schedule from the beginning, but then we have a lot of time to really work through our thoughts on design. Um, as noted, we've already begun some of the extinct conditions work and folks have been out on site, really want to understand uh, the flood regime. And as noted, the community engagement in the beginning of the project, we find that it's really important um, for the community itself to, to, to be sort of the driver of that. You know, you're experts in the community, you live there year round, um, and we will very much take into account the recommendations that you make in terms of who we should be engaging with. Already we've received really great feedback um, and we'll be here to support the community on that. And then in the second half of the project, we'll be uh, able to, to do a little bit more of a, uh, you know, community-based um, meetings and discussions and our CADIS will be able to lead that. I'm a trained facilitator, so, I hope that I'll be able to come on island and and help uh, you know work through um, you know interactive meetings uh, because community doesn't want typically to come to a meeting and be talked to um, and so we really want to try to develop some innovative ways illustrations design uh, based visuals um, to engage the community um, and then of course that's going to be critical for moving into uh, the selected. Uh, design alternative. Um, so that's just a high level overview. And the next slide, we wanted to, uh, to show you that we will have these waves of engagement. It's really literally shown here with the wave um, because we understand that it's critical to receive feedback at key points of the project. And so this is just essentially showing that, you know, the engagement will be ramping up in this first wave uh, very soon into March um, to work with you, talk with uh, key stakeholders like the Steamship Authority, uh, town departments that would be involved in anything related to this uh, design, whether it's maintenance or uh, you know being involved in the uh, uh, making decisions about design. And then the wave, you know, kind of goes down a little bit, July and August, clearly um, summer months, there are people who will be on island that we will want to talk to, um, but it, it's a busy time. And so we then will sort of ramp that back up for public engagement during the uh, preliminary design. Um, so this is something that's really critical. We will continue to have engagement throughout the project. And this is just sort of giving you that high level understanding of what we intend to do at what points in the project. And then the next slide is where I will turn it over to Trevor uh, because we have some important next steps that we want to discuss with you. Yep, and this is this is the last slide for you know, just to uh, give you a sense of the timing here. Um, but yeah, so we're we're underway um, as Julie alluded to. You know, we do have an aggressive schedule here in year one, um, just given the the deadlines that are attached to the uh, funding source. So. Uh, we're moving quickly um, on our field work. So uh, Child's Engineering has already been on the island doing a waterfront structural assessment. They'll be issuing their uh, findings to us uh, shortly, um, and that will be folded into our existing conditions and data cap report. Um, overall, uh, we'll also be looking at integrating a lot of the survey work that, that has happened in the area. There's obviously been a lot of work recently from the Easy Street Park uh, championed by the land bank. Um, bulkhead improvements uh, in, uh, back in, I believe, 2017. So we'll be kind of integrating a lot of this work that has recently happened, um, making updates to that that uh, existing conditions material um, and developing a really solid understanding of the current state of our site. Um, and that's really the foundation for the design work to begin uh, early this spring. 
Um, and then, yeah, uh, Julia mentioned the flood assessment. So we'll be working closely with Woods Hole Group, um, leveraging uh, the Massachusetts Coast Flood Risk Model as the best available uh, coastal flood hazard data, um, trying to wrap our heads around some of the stormwater management issues that are quite complicated in this area, um, and developing an understanding of, of what's really at risk, when is it at risk, um, and you know what, what will the impacts or consequences of that risk be. Um, that helps us both tell a story to the public about the necessity for this project, but it also helps us quantify those risks um, to create a benefit cost analysis um, that can be used to justify um, funding from various sources, um, whether local, state, or federal. Um, obviously, this is just three of the early stage steps. We'll be continuing to interact with this committee throughout and provide updates uh, along with uh, updates to Leah and, and other town leadership about our progress along the way. Um, and I know we've already had a little bit of discussion and, and don't certainly don't want to take up too much time on the agenda, but happy to answer any last questions here uh, before we conclude. Peter, back to you. Thanks, Trevor. Um, anybody, any of our committee members have additional questions or comments for Trevor? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Jen, go, off. go ahead. Thanks, Pete, and thanks, Trevor. I just had a quick question because I can't remember, and it didn't come up in the presentation. Um, but is there a particular time frame that we're designing this for? How far out are you going? Or is that really going to be determined by um, feedback as the design? Hmm. Yeah. Um, Peter, would you like me to answer? Yeah, go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, that's a great question, Jen. I think, yeah, so the if you remember from the Coastal Resilience Plan, we looked at kind of a horizon uh, uh, at 2070. Um, as the quote unquote design flood elevation or level of protection mm -hmm. um, tied to coast uh, tidal flooding. Um, so if you achieve a design flood elevation tied to tidal flooding in the future, you're also protecting against you know larger storms in the near term. Um, I think this will be a question that we're going to have to work through as as we do our our alternatives because there's trade-offs, right? And achieving a certain higher elevation could have visual impacts that or other impacts that are not desirable today um, and you know may not be necessary to, to sort of absorb today. So um, there is a reference to this sort of dynamic adaptation pathways. So one of the things we'll be thinking about is, you know, is there near-term actions we can take a project that could be implemented, say, in the next five years that addresses the risks today through, you know, 2030 or 2050, whatever the, the horizon is, that can then be later adapted to a higher elevation um, when that is necessary. And, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is just one section of the downtown waterfront. Um, you know, the flood risk over time becomes much more um, expansive. And so there's going to need to be an integration of different projects across the downtown. Um, you know, the I, I see Rachel's on the call, the Washington mm -hmm. Street project will ultimately have to be tied into what happens on Easy Street, what happens on, you know, Steamboat Wharf, what happens on Straight Wharf. So, we need to be thinking about kind of the integration of these projects over time and the level of protection provided. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, Gary, go ahead. You're still on mute, Gary. Thanks, uh, uh, Peter and Trevor. Uh, I think you just already answered uh, the question I was going to raise, and that is that this particular study is just a small portion of the downtown issue you know my uh, uh, you know one of the one of the goals that i have always felt very important for the study is the downtown barrier the the, the kind of closing the harbor you know the way new bedford has done already or way where they have in venice and uh, and well, i guess what you said is as you're going through with this process you you folks will keep in mind the other kind of issues for the rest of the closing of the harbor that we might have to deal with over over the next 10 to 20, 25 years. Thanks, Gary. Do we have any more comments? Any more questions? Tim? Yeah, uh, this may be too specific, but I'm curious if as part of your data collection, you do traffic studies, both foot traffic and vehicle traffic along there? We 
to answer that, we that is actually not part of our scope to do a traffic analysis. Um, we can certainly leverage any traffic data that exists um, or has been collected by the town and, and work closely with the town's engineering staff to, uh, to understand that. Um, but yeah, we don't have any detailed engineering traffic studies. Now, the civil engineering components of roadway design, that is part of our scope through the preliminary design phase, but um, traffic analysis is is not. Uh, we could probably, you know, in terms of easy street, I think, uh, you know, we can certainly utilize data from Steamboat you know, or Steamship Authority as to the number of vehicles that might be coming to and from Steamboat Wharf over time. But, uh yeah. I think I, I would just say I think foot traffic is is going to be important there because there's a lot of it and how people shop there, walk there, so on um, is is going to be important. I don't know how to go about doing that, but I just thought I'd bring it up. Thank you. Certainly, uh, certainly hear that. Yep. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Trevor. Uh, anybody else? Okay, we'll open it up to public comment. Is there any members of the public that would like to comment on, on this item, on this discussion? Okay, um, seeing none. Um, thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Arcadis. Really, really appreciate you guys keeping us updated. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, so update on Leah. When is this? This is coming up later in the meeting, or is Vince going to do it now? Um, so that'll be later in the meeting, hoping around eleven thirty. And Trevor, Julie, and Michelle, feel free to um, leave if you want. Okay. Thank you. Um, discussion on developing an informational sheet regarding coastal risks and coastal resilience issues on Nantucket. The handout to buyers. So some of us did our homework and some of us did not, or maybe you have it with you today. Uh, so what Lee and I thought would be that uh, those of us who um, have it ready would read our um, our suggestions, our recommendations, and hopefully that would spawn a conversation amongst uh, all of us. How does that sound? Are the ones who have their homework ready to read what they wrote. And I can go first so you can find it on your computers. Dead silence. Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll start off. Um, so I've got five recommendations. Inform buyers of the realities of sea level rise impacts for Nantucket. This would be a brief, succinct, succinct statement, statement that leaves no doubt in buyers' minds who are considering purchases within uh, vulnerable parts of the island. And then, of course, list the low-lying, high-risk, vulnerable areas of the island. Um, there you know, might even be a... Um, uh, if, I don't think this would happen, but you know, there could be a... Um, in whatever brochures or publications that the realtors produce for people to see the various parts of the island where houses are for sale, there would be a note or a map or something that would tell people this is an area that, of concern. Um, okay, explain what the CRP is and then provide links to the plan, um, and, you know, in the executive summary and then the homeowner guide in the plan. <clears throat> uh, a brief statement on or mention of the federal flood insurance program through uh, the federal emergency management agency FEMA um, that has certain requirements of homeowners living within floodplains before they'll issue flood insurance. And then finally provide a link to whatever CRP sea level rise video is going to, uh, is going live and urge uh, homeowner buyers to watch it. Okay, who wants to go next? Okay, Gary. Well, uh, just the, uh, the brief squib that I sent to Leah, uh, I'll read it to you. Um, I basically said, you know, whatever we put in there, um, it, 
it can't be so negative as to engage the wrath of the real estate industry on the island, which we know is an important part of the engine that uh, runs Nantucket. So this is so I took a couple of comments from the uh, actual from the um, summary, the executive summary of the uh, Coastal Resilience Plan, and this is what I wrote her. These two little comments. The first one was a comment that says climate change impacts are detectable on the island and are becoming more frequent. And then I took another paragraph that says island-wide resilience strategies include governance, planning, and policy-based recommendations that will help Nantucket reduce its risk in the near term and build capacity to implement and plan for resilience over the long term. So those are the two comments I took out of the plan, which I thought we could safely include in buyer's materials without, as I say, getting the real estate industry up in arms about we're trying to kill their business or whatever they might say. Great, great. Thanks, Gary, for taking the time to put some thought into that. Um, okay. There was a third person, Leah, who, who, who did it? Yeah, the third one was Matt B. Okay. Matt, if you've got yours at hand, can you go ahead? Uh, you can you can go to Shelly or go to someone else and come back either way. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say it quick. I, I, I agree with, I think there should be a link. Uh, like in Florida and places, they re, some of these towns require a link to Flood Factor or some other uh, website that tells what the risks are. And I think that we should be doing something similar, similar, and uh, and 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 so so people have an understanding of what the you know what the impacts are of these various areas. And I think you know as we're seeing now with the concom with people pushing back because oh we, you know we should be able to build more. We want to build pools in these areas, and we want to build more. I think that some of those things will end up being. Uh, sort of short-sighted perhaps. People might make money now, but they could be a real issue for those homeowners and for the entire area later. So I think it's important that we, you know, sort of base it on facts and base it on, uh, you know, what is the good, you know, sort of short, medium, long-term decisions to be making now so that it's in everyone's best interest, including the people buying in these at-risk areas. And I think that's what Shelley's going to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And I just wanted to sort of go off of what Matt said before Shelley comments. Um, and, you know, I agree, sh we shouldn't make it negative. Um, but we should scare people a little bit, just, <laughs> just as a hook. And this is, you know, postal resilience and what's coming at us. And if you keep up in the news and look at what, you know, the dire predictions of what's happening to the glaciers um, uh, at both ends of the world. Um, it doesn't matter how positive we paint it. People are going to read into it. They're going to read negativity into it. Um, we, we just have to, I guess we just have to give them, you know, the reality. The reality may be negative, but we were trying to be positive and protect our islands by doing this. So uh, go ahead, Shelley. Yeah, Gary. I appreciate your concern for the real estate agency, <laughs> of which I'm part of. Um, but this isn't about catering to the real estate agencies. They're going to sell houses no matter what. This is about making them accept that this is our material facts that they have to deliver. That That's the goal of what Leah and I have been working on with uh, Isabel Perkins, who's a continuing ed instructor on the Cape, trying to incorporate into the environmental risks class that of continuing ed that real estate agents take, trying to include a component on coastal resiliency in that course, where I think we're just about done. I think we have one more meeting and uh, Isabel's comfortable with what she's going to present in that class. But the bottom line is this is about dragging the real estate agents, see your real estate business, kicking and screaming if need be, to the fact that this information is not being disseminated in a responsible manner. So there's going to be blowback, period. There always is on Nantucket, you know, when you bring about change anyway. But the concern of why I got in on this wagon as a real estate professional isn't that we're protected. It's that 
buyers in the island are protected. So, um, you know, I'll stand in the line of fire. It, it may take a year or so, but everybody, the hope is that the consumer ultimately expects this information and wants this information and demands the information and that a good real estate agent gives it. And we're not going to be there on the first stretch, first round, but that's the goal. So. Great. Yet, I had one more quick comment about your, hey, uh, your two inclusions, um, Gary, about, I think, you know, and I've worked with Lee a lot with this, What's, what's critically important as far as what we're going to disseminate to homeowners, in my humble opinion, is that your goals are wonderful, but they're not necessarily a real estate agent to their buyer goals. You have a much larger, huger picture, which is wonderful. We need bullet short points to how this is going to affect a consumer. And, and they're two, they run parallel, but one is much, much, much thinner. You know, and 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 we don't want the agents or their consumers to glaze over with, you know, as, as big a scope as you guys handle, which is which is incredible. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so I'm sorry, there's three people ahead of me, but I just I don't want to lose the thought. So currently, there's a construction project going on um, at the bottom of Loretta Lane in between those two houses. There's one, you come to the end of the Loretta Lane and you can see that house. And then you take a 45 degree turn to the right and there's a project right there. And I think a house is going in there. Um, and then there's the Octagon house right there, which is currently being renovated on the inside. And there has got to be something in there, a bullet item that says something, a very cautionary statement about building in vulnerable, low-lying areas. That house is going to be built there. I think it's crazy. I don't care what they do. They're going to get wet sooner than they think. So stuff like that, I agree. <clears throat> um, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, just a, a suggestion um, for something to put on the list um, to alert people of the CONCOM regulations and how it might affect how and where they can build on their property and how those buffer zones and so on may change over time. Because uh, those are real regulations they're going to run into. Thank you, Tim. Um, you Jen? Thanks, Pete. And Tim, you said what I was going to say. I completely agree. The CONCOM regs are likely to link to the state ones. There's some pretty significant what you can do in floodplains that are coming. <laughs> I think just the links to the uh, go for understanding what they can and can't do in a property that they're given, so they have all the right information. I also think, you know, we're, we're scaring people a little bit, but it would also be good to give people, hey, here are the things you can do. You know, we have a, an adaptation guide for home how we can connect that or put pieces in, encouraging native landscaping and all those kind of things to say, okay, you're buying a house in a in an area that uh, uh, is maybe at risk, here's how you can make it more resilient so that we can kind of get both pieces um, together. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Sarah? Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess my comment is sort of along those same lines is that um, in terms of creating like the bullet points like Sher Shelly was talking about, but having them link to places where they can find the most up-to-date pertinent information. Um, I liked in the packet, I saw Matt's link to like, you know, specific, you know, where your property location is. Because if we put anything like that's static, you know, like these are the areas that are vulnerable, obviously like it's going to change. And so people will use that for a long time. So I think both um, links to the CRP, but to Shelly's point, people that are looking at this are going to want like a sort of quick and dirty where the CRP has all the information, but you want like, where's the information that's pertinent to whether or not I want to buy this house or this is the right location for me or what can I do here? And so between the CONCOM, the specific links to um, the sea level rise at different time periods and then erosion. So like we have to think about what exactly we're linking, but I really do think it has to be something that is not like aside from the CRP, that's not something that we maintain that it is like an outside website that has those links um, or the the visuals of what the vulnerability is. Um, it's going to be obviously different wherever you are in the island, what you're looking at. Um, 
And I had another point that I totally just forgot. Um, sorry. Uh, but I, I do think I like what Jen was saying too about that, having those positive points of like, great, you have a house here, like, you know, and, and thinking of like the planting plans and what the, um, thinking about, you know, the native landscaping and where, you know, are we going to like filter water or where do you do a storm water? I don't know, like whatever the other assets that we have and resources that we can point people to, I think um, that would be a really valuable part of it as well. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I kind of, I look at some of this positively. If you're buying, you know, I'll pick on Brant Point for a second. If you're buying a property in Brant Point and you're doing a large renovation, if you know, you might make a different choice. You might not try to put a full basement with a half a million dollar, you know, sort of uh, TV system and everything else or a bowling alley or whatever. You might say, hey, you know, we're going to raise this building and we're going to have this thing is going to be ready for the next 30 years. I mean, I think I, I see it as a positive. It might just change people's uh, sort of their actions and their expectations if they know ahead. So that you know, I, I look at it not as being negative, but just being, you know, giving people the, the right information, the right facts so that they make good choices for themselves. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Go ahead, Shelley. I had one more quick comment. In in your world, um, to not <clears throat> duplicate resources, right? A lot of what you guys mentioned just now about setbacks and this real estate agents have to do that already. That that's already part of the deliverable. So just save your resources for something we're already doing. You know, I know it doesn't seem it sometimes when we look at these houses that that could possibly be legal, but they are because they got permits. So, you know, we're we're already disclosing setbacks, conservation, wetlands. We're, we're, we're already doing that. So save your resources on that. What What's really critical from you guys' point of view is what people can't see on paper yet, right? Because if, if, if there's a setback and we need to show that, but what I'm kind of hoping our association with your organization does is helps us convey to a buyer what they can't see yet and and what that's going to do to their property to, if anyway yeah excellent uh are there any more comments or questions okay any comments from the public okay great discussion great discussion i i'm glad we could get this get this rolling and helping Shelly out. What what would be the next steps for us on this, Leah? Um, so I will work up the information that I just gathered from all of you um, and then work with Florencia and Haley from the communications office to figure out how to design it um, and you know find the, the different links and all of that. So once that gets designed, then I'll bring it back to you all um, and we'll see what needs to get edited or tweaked and then go from there. Excellent. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Shelly. Please stay if you want to. Um, okay. Um, all right. Um, review of letter to the select board on Nantucket wetlands bylaw amendments concerning expansion of buffer zones. Um, I believe we have got that letter to you uh, this morning at some point. Um, and you guys have all seen it, maybe. Do you want me to sh share my screen, Peter? Sure. And I will take all the edits. I've got it open up in my Word document. So however you guys think I should change it or add to it. Um, the Conservation Commission uh, Chairman Ian Golding uh, agreed to keep their public hearing open long enough so that we could get our letter in. So they, they meet next on uh, Thursday. So we're hoping that, that uh, 
we won't have to go through a lengthy select board approval process and we can just get the letter to them right away. Do you want okay. to comment? <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm, no, I'm just sort of waiting to see if you guys all have you all read it or are you reading it right now? Reading it right now. Okay. Um, I Let's raised just, my hand because I already read it and have edits, but if you want to wait. I'm just going to wait like two or three minutes. You guys all let me know when you're done. We all good? Yeah, we're good. I'm good. Okay, I'll start with Doug. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, my only comments I had forwarded to you in an email this morning to you and Leah. I just find it difficult to offer very specific, uh, like proofreading edits in a live meeting. So hopefully that accomplishes that task. I did have a question. It's it's regarding um, sort of the turnaround time here. Is it our hope that the select board would approve issuing this prior to? the cutoff date for submission for a Thursday CONCOM yes. meeting? Yes, and it's okay. absolutely our hope that maybe our select board representative would say we wouldn't have to send it to the select board. Um, we're hoping, <laughs> hoping for that. Um, I specifically got Ian to give us some more time because they, I think we're going to end the public hearing before we had a chance to get this in. And just a little background so you know, um, we didn't really have much notice about when they were going to end their public hearing. So we didn't have enough time to to, to vet this. Um, and so I had to scramble to see if I could get more time. And I have gotten just a couple of days, but hoping that, that uh, the select board can trust us. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the main thing I wanted to just point out at this meeting um, is that I think we have to be careful about, about broad blanket statements. So where it says, um, I don't know what line or whatever, but like expect that the vegetated wetlands are expected to eventually be underwater. I think, you know, we know that with climate change, sea level rise, storm surge, you know, wastewater, you know, like, or not wastewater, stormwater runoff, like there's, there's going to be changes to vegetated wetlands. They're not going to all change the same. So because if you imagine like in parts of the wetlands, if they expand, if the water flows, you know, it might, it's not going to just like uniformly get bigger. It's going, the, the, the edge of the delineated wetland will change, you know, but we don't know exactly how across the whole entire island. So I think we should change it to something along the lines of like, that they are expected to be impacted by sea level rise and other climate change impacts. And in many cases, the vegetated wetland edge will expand if that's what you're trying to get at, or the the edge of the delineated wetland will change. So I, I, I don't know exactly if we wanna say that it will expand, but I, I just feel like we have to be really careful about making these broad blanket statements because I think because it's not exactly true that every wetland will will change in the same way, I would be concerned that um, you know that they wouldn't take our point. <laughs> okay, can you write what you think it should be and then email that to me? Yes. Because yes. I'm travel I'm traveling tomorrow, and so anything that's going to get done and go into that letter is going to happen today. So I can I can do it right after this meeting. I just only read it right before the meeting started. So, and I have one other question um, yep. for a change for the second part or um so when we say in that second part about that we recommend that that the buffer zones are going to shift and so they should I, I don't like I'm kind of confused because 
each wetland before a project happens is delineated. So if I'm understanding this correctly, I could be wrong because I've never sat on the Conservation Commission. But my assumption is if any project happens and a wetland is specifically delineated at that project, that is per that is specific to that moment in time, obviously. And so then the 50 foot buffer would be based on that. It doesn't have to be revisited by the CONCOM every so often. Is that correct? Because I think that that changes that how this paragraph is. You're talking about the paragraph where I begin further, the crack recommends that that paragraph. Yes. In, yes. In light of this, we, we recommend that the Conservation Commission work in a mechanism for these buffer zones to quickly adapt as needed to rising water levels along the shores of our, yeah. So uh, my my point is because each project requires a delineation of a wetland, it, it that mechanism is already built in that as that changes, it would therefore change. But I, I could be wrong. That's just my understanding of how it happens. <clears throat> is that correct, Tim? Um, I, I, I should know the answer to this. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I know that they rely on pre-existing maps at the moment. Um, I don't know. Um, it's I, I don't really know. I, I think there may be that surveys are required to check those uh, uh, guidelines on the on the wetlands, but I'm not sure. Sorry, I, I wish I did know. Okay, I'm going to take, uh, thanks, Tim. I'm going to take uh, um, Jen Carberg, who can help us probably. They do need to be redone, um, particularly with new applications. I think it's three. I think it's three years that a delineation is considered acceptable. And then if you're coming in again, it needs to be redone. I have to double check the time to bring, but there is a mechanism to react to that potential shift. Then. So maybe I could say we recommend that the conservation patient continue to rely on the mechanism for these buffer zones to quickly adapt, something like that. Okay. Um, can I do my comment, Pete? Say again? Can I, can I do my comment next as opposed to just responding? Sure. Thanks. Um, the comment I was going to have is a little bit in line with what Sarah was saying, just making sure we get the wording um, right at what we're thinking of for change. And I think with the buffer change, it's like allowing our Coastal resource area buffer, like giving our coastal resource areas space to move or protection because we know that they're going to be impacted by sea level rise and erosion. So that's really, at least in my mind, the, um, the reason for that larger buffer is because we know we'll get erosion, we know we'll have sea level rise, salt marshes need space to migrate. I think the reason for extending that buffer change to all of the wetlands is that we know that we're going to have rising groundwater that's going to impact our inland freshwater wetlands so their boundaries may expand. We don't know the degree to that yet, so we're basing this change, you know, up to 50 feet is being based on the research and what's happened elsewhere, but in my mind, those are the two kind of primary reasons for encouraging an expansion of that no, um, it's not yeah, no build impact zone. It's not what? I think in my mind, those are the two reasons for saying that the no impact buffer zone is shifting from 25 to 50 feet. It's like giving space for coastal resources to be able to react to changes along the shoreline and then the inland wetlands because of the rise in groundwater and potential expansion with increased precipitation. Okay. And if you want, if you want me to put that in an email to you after this, I could do that. <laughs> yeah, if you could, if you could email me and copy Leo or the other way around, that'd be great. Yeah. Um. All right, Matt, go ahead. No, uh, two things. One is uh, the under the word it said uh, we recommend. You know, maybe they it's something like instead of recommend, it's uh, maybe we say something like continue to recognize shifting in land much sooner, et cetera. You know, down below, it could cross shifting in land, something like that. Just instead of recommending, just they continue to realize, you know, or recognize that this is happening. Uh, the other thing is, if you are doing a project, there are the maps. 
but you do have to have a survey. You have to hire an engineer and he comes and digs holes and looks for plants and, and, and does that kind of thing. And so increasingly as they require that, you know, areas that are expanding are going to be expanded and it's going to make it harder. So I was answering that earlier question. All right. Thanks. And do, do you, do you think we really have to show this to the select board and town administration before we send it to the concom or can we just skip that step? I would, I would send it just to be, you know, just to be safe. And, and if we say, if you send it today, maybe we can get it, maybe we can get it quickly. I can get it quickly discussed tomorrow night because we're under a deadline. Okay. I'll, and I'm sending it to Erica, correct? Yeah, I was yeah, send it to Erica, maybe copy Don as chair and you know, and just see what and see is there any and say it's time sensitive and me, so I remember, and then say it's okay. time sensitive. Okay. And I think the key point is that we support them. You know, a lot of what we're doing here is is fine tuning, but let's support them. You know. Okay. Okay. Are there any other comments? I like the letter, Peter. Thanks, Gary. I like how it's developing as well. Uh, Rachel, go ahead. Look, my hand just raised. Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble with my reactions today. Um, I, uh, I I actually don't want to make a comment specifically on this letter. I really appreciate you writing the letter. And um, I, I think it's a great point. I just wanted to throw something out there as food for thought. Um, it's not totally unrelated, but it, for the purposes of this topic, I think it should be considered unrelated. I was in a conversation yesterday about coastal resiliency. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about is um, the concept of living with water as being one component of resiliency. And um, while I'm totally supportive of these regulations um, environmentally, and I, I think this is a good shift, I see a conflict with the concept of kind of living with water. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there because I was thinking about it and I, I don't know the answer, um, but it it's just that I I can see how these things may not work together. And I'm not sure that there is a great way to make them work together, but I just wanted to put it out there as good for thought. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Matt? Yeah, I think Rachel has hit on something uh, pretty critical. Because maybe, you know, maybe we'll pick on Brand Point again because Gary's here, but maybe in the future, Brand Point will be raised and there'll be, you know, walkways and water flowing in, but still beautiful homes. And so maybe the homes will be a little bit, uh, you know, maybe they can expand a little sideways, you know, as long as the water is flowing through in and out of the, you know, the areas it needs to flow. Uh, I think that that's, you know, I, I, that's a future, but I think, you know, but I think when you look at what's going to happen there, you know, I could see that being what happens in 30 or 50 years, and it'd still be a very popular uh, place. And, and some of the work that was done by some of the colleges showed sort of dunes and other things off in the water, you know, sort of helping to protect that area. But the whole, that showed the whole area, you know, out into the harbor as wetlands going all the way in up to the bottom of the cliff almost. And so... So these types of, you know, you can't do anything, uh, regulations would not allow that. So it is a good thing for us to be thinking about. So thank you, Rachel, for that. Thanks, Matt. Uh, any other comments? Okay, I guess we have our marching orders. Oh, wait, go ahead, Jen. Sorry, thanks, Pete. Just one quick, quick thing, and I completely agree both Rachel and Matt with what you're saying. Um, it might be nice just to have a sentence in there encouraging the CONCOM to think of how to approve adaptive measures in coastal areas. Um, but I think, I believe, 
that we a local organization can't be more permissive than the state organization than the state regulations go. So um, right now the state doesn't appear to be open to that kind of living with water adaptations. So we can't make our regulations that way. We can't allow more than what the state does. But I think it's something that we as a community need to think about how we bring that into the conversation, I guess. Okay. All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, I'll get Leah's notes and um, and then I'll adjust the letter and, and then I'll uh, send it out today sometime. Leah? Peter? Yeah. Um, you will need someone to make a motion that you can you know send the letter um, as you read it, wrote it since, or you know with the edits and stuff. Um, since we don't have the final letter right now. Okay, you guys, all understand that you're you're gonna trust us to produce a letter based on your comments and and get it out in a timely manner. I make a motion to accept the letter as written plus the edits discussed. Second that. Okay, Sarah made the motion and Gary seconded. Um, all those in favor by roll call vote. Uh, I'm just going to go top to bottom. Jen Carberg. Aye. Gary Beller. Aye. Uh, Sarah Boyce. Aye. Tim Brain. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Doug Rose. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Abby DiMolina. You there, Abby? Abby D. Molina. Okay. Uh, chair votes aye. Um, okay. So we will move on. Um, an update on uh, 2023 to 2020 CRP recommendations that have not been started and discuss a prioritization list. And I think we'll do the same thing we did with number six. We were just read our prioritizations. Um, and now the discussion hopefully will come out of that. We can all tell each other that we're crazy for number one. Number two is wrong and whatever. So I'll start with mine. Top 10 projects, 2023 to 2020, 2030, um, one through 10. Uh, Surfside wastewater treatment plant, dune restoration, uh, steamboat wharf resilience, updates the zoning bylaw, strategic retreat and relocation program, Madiket Road raising bridge and uh, raising and bridge conversion, stormwater management plan, numerical modeling study of CO2 breaching, Department of Public Works facility and landfill resilience, Scottsdale Bluff dune restoration. Those are my one through tens. Does anyone else want to go next? Gary. Peter, may I just suggest that uh, it would be kind of awkward for each of us to go through a reordering of the 10 projects. I did, uh, I have a list of the way I reordered them, but if each of us does that, we're not going to end up with any conclusion. So my suggestion is that to the extent you and Leah have received our recommendations, why don't you just add them up and whatever the consensus is of the group, you put them in the new revised order, that's all. Okay, that's fine. Um, so what you're saying is um, we just put this off to the next meeting and we do the work behind, behind the scenes and bring it back for the next meeting, is that what you're saying? So you already have the information from us, our recommendations. All you really have to do is be the scorekeeper, uh, and um, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, Sarah. Yeah. Um. In the packet, Leah actually already did that, but said she's not in. I'm just. <laughs> she would probably say this, but in the packet, she did a tally sheet of all the recommendations. So, like, if you pull up the packet and share your screen, it's like zoning had the most votes. Reaching. I mean, I I'm assuming that's what this 
was the compiled recommendations right. with tallies. I didn't get, I didn't realize that she did that. Um, so she already did exactly what Gary was suggesting. Okay. Well, she's not sitting here, so it's not really fair, but we both sort of agreed that we should read our top tens. But um, if you guys don't want to do that and, and we'll go with what she did in the packet. Um, so. Okay, Leah. So um, I just read my top 10 and they panned me and said that we should rely on what you did in the packet of listing um, um, how uh, the group, how the group prioritized everything, so. Okay, you want me to share my screen? For the sure. tally? Okay. Do you want me to read these, Peter? What, how do you want to go um, about this? Well, we can all see it, right? Yeah. I'll see you later. Bye. All right, thanks, bye. Okay. Well, then we should just go with this. Do we need to take a vote on it? Or do we want to talk about it? Yeah, this is Matt. I have a comment if I could. Go ahead. I had as my top uh, one something that wasn't there, which is we need to figure out how we're going to pay for this stuff and how we're going to do betterments and how we're going to model it. And, you know, is it betterments until we get a coastal resiliency districts? And then is it through districts? And I think that that is a question we get all the time. It's a concern that the community has and the neighborhoods have. I think that that needs to rise to a level of importance so you know anyway so that so I, I so if we just vote what existed how do we handle something like that make it 11 things instead of 10. sarah yeah thanks i mean i totally agree with matt except I, what i i guess i was understanding this as like what are the project like specific projects and actually the rec, the ranking helps us think about funding so i think it depends obviously on the the project like zoning is a bit, much bigger thing than a, like a an actionable project um and i think the actionable projects that rise to the surface then you can look at okay where is this a town project is this a collaborative project that we can apply for grants like i think it's helpful to do this prioritization. To me, it's helpful to see it without the funding piece, just to kind of go like, okay, what do we like? What are the priorities that have to happen, or at least be started, so that we can ultimately get to that, get to more funding. And then I think maybe we have this list, and then we have another list that uses this as the base, and then discusses some of the funding, if that makes sense. Because I think. I don't, I mean, obviously this can't happen without the funding piece, but I think I, it's helpful for me personally to see this and then go, okay, now that we know we have this sort of like priority list and a lot of these are sort of tied for interest, but you can just basically see what rises to that immediate, then the funding piece kind of not follows, but it gives you, gives us more of a target. Leah. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, yeah, if we can, I guess, rank these one through 10, like what Sarah said, it, it helps, um, well, it definitely helps staff, but also CRAC. When we're going for grants, we can say, you know, CRAC has voted that this is like number one priority for this year to work on or, or whatever it may be. Um, but, you know, for months and months, you guys have all been talking about prioritizing the priority projects. And so that's what we're going to do. That's my hope is to do that today. Um, obviously, there's more than 10 projects on this compiled list. So, um, you know, I just counted, I think six of them have had six votes, uh, six or five votes. So, you know, those could go on to the list. Um, and then I don't know how you want to kind of filter it out from there. But if we can rank them from one to 10, let's say, 
or 12, whatever it may be, um, that'll be helpful. It also is helpful to see those in a list and then um, know which exact projects to start to try to move forward um, immediately. So you, uh, I'm not following you. You you want us to re-rank them based on what we're looking at here on the screen? Yeah, so these are not ranked at all. These are what the bold is, is tallies. So for example, zoning, six people had that on their list. Six people had retreat and relocation program. So okay. then what we need to do from all of these tallies is to rank these specific recommendations. Number one, is it zoning? Is it retreat and relocation? Um, and then go from there. Okay. So that's more homework for the for our next meeting, correct? No, we can do it right now. Oh, okay. But I think oh. that's what we've done. That's Lee, that's what you've already done. In other words, the most people, we there were six votes for 1.2 to be the number one priority on things that have not yet been started. So we don't have to redo there's that also, again. That's fine. There's also oh okay. So maybe we have a also been six six votes okay. for retreat and relocation. There's been five votes for uh these four recommendations. So you know it's is zoning number one or is retreat and relocation number one? That's what we kind of need to figure out. Okay. Is Surfside Wastewater Restoration number three or is it number six? Um, so I guess we could start with, with these ones. So essentially, uh -huh. we're all in the hot seat right now. We're going to solve this and come up with a list before we're done. Um, do we want to do that, or do I want to take the people who have things to say now, and then we do that? Okay, Doug, what do you got? Uh, sorry, this is actually more of a response to Matt's point, and it, and I, I use this. I would look at this list as sort of evidence of, of why I feel the way I do. I wouldn't personally put something like the CRD betterment idea uh, at the top ten. And the reason is because if you look at the things that are the most critical, essential tasks to allow the island to continue to function, they are island-wide in their scope. And if it's an island-wide program like Steamship Wharf or it's uh, zoning or what have you, those are things that won't require neighborhood groups to gather together and put together their own sort of funding strategy. Those are clearly going to be island wide. They're going to impact the taxpayer, and I don't see any. I guess, I guess that's I, that's why I'm I'm looking at it differently. I think than Matt is. I don't d doubt that someday we're going to have to figure out the betterment issue, and I'm, I'm not saying it shouldn't be on the list of things to do. I I just wouldn't put it on our top ten list, because I do think I think Tim Brain used an interesting word many many meetings ago. He talked about balkanization, and I think the more we enable individual neighborhood groups to push their own sort of coastal resilience strategies that are that are specifically and only relevant to their neighborhood it encourages balkanization and encourages people to go off into their corners and fight on things that are of greatest interest to them and i feel like we're better off if we can keep our focus island wide what are the essential infrastructure needs that serve every nantucketer not just the corner of uh you know, pick a corner, uh, Western Madigan. So that's all I got. Okay, interesting. Uh, Joanna? Mm, uh, yep, yeah, thanks. I am looking at this and also thinking about maybe the thing or the approach that could work is that we we divide this into three priorities like A, B, and C and put different items in different buckets and then look at the top ones in each of the buckets because I'm trying to figure out a way to organize this data in, in a way that makes sense for everyone. Because I think that the list is good. It's got everything that I would have picked on there, right? But limiting it to 10 is gonna be the challenge. And everybody's frozen. No, we're listening. We're nope, listening. You're, you're all frozen on my screen though. <laughs> that's great. Oh. Well, <laughs> Thank just, you. just started snowing, so maybe that's it. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's my thought. If that's helpful or not, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Matt, go ahead. I think that's a pretty good, that's a good suggestion. 
when I look at this list, I see a lot of these things I don't think are projects. I think they're plans. You know, I think a project is you're doing something, you're getting something done, you know, necessarily, you know, and I think that's what the public is looking for. You know, so when we met three or four years ago at uh, the Nantucket Hotel, we picked off a couple projects that would be great to do short term. And, uh, you know, I, one was uh, out at Sakacha was correcting something that we did wrong out there and making that resilient. And I can't remember what the other one was. I think it was out in Madikett. It might have been the Dune Field or something in Madikett that I think may have been done. So I think, you know, the goal is to let people see some things being done. Uh, I'll, it, I'll push back a little bit on, you know, pu you know uh, uh, pushing how we're going to pay for it away because I look at it similar to the sewer. There was a, when we did that, 25 years ago, there was a huge push to just sewer the whole island, put it on everybody. It'll be fine. And that was, you know, not necessary and was would have been prohibitively expensive. And so we had to, you know, make a choice of which areas really need to be sewer and how are we going to pay for it? I think coastal resiliency is the same. If, if you know, if Sheep Pond, I'll pick on Sheep's Pond, if Sheep Pond could get us to pay to raise their roads or Build, you know, build bridges for them or do whatever for six or eight or 12 homes, we'd have to do that. You know, and if we set the precedent and have to do that, we're setting a bad precedent. The same thing with Madikett. We could be spending tens of millions of dollars to build roads to an area that all the roads, all the private roads are flooded. And so I think that, you know, if that, if we are going to build roads, the people in those areas have, who are gaining the benefit should be paying a good amount of that benefit. We don't, there aren't enough dollars in the, you know, there aren't gonna be enough dollars and enough capacity for the taxpayers to fund everything that wants to be funded. And so, you know, if people are willing to pay, you know, and do a good percentage of it themselves, more things will get done more quickly. And that's just kind of, I've been on the FinCom, I've been on the select board a long time. That's kind of how it works sometimes and it should work that way more often than not. And I think that there has been, there's a tendency to the, from the staff to not want to do betterments because the people with the betterments aren't happy and they call and complain. People view it as extra work and they say, who's going to do it? How are we going to do it? Uh, I think that we need to model it and have regulations and put it in place like we've done with the sewer, or it's going to get pushed down the road and my kid is going to be trying to figure out how to do it. So that, yeah, so anyway, I look looking at this list, some of it is planning, some of it is projects, you know, maybe we should be breaking it into projects, you know, maybe, maybe make the three buckets or four buckets like Joanna is saying and prioritize what are physical projects that are going to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Rachel. I agree with Matt. I just really, I think that he points out something um, really important that a lot of these are plans and one of them could be a plan for, you know, how are we going to address funding issues? Um, so I, I just think it's a, a, an excellent thing to be considering. Thanks. Okay, so what do you guys want to do? we've gone away from it being just a list of 10 or 11 or 12 things. And I think leaning toward groupings of things with priorities within them. Is that what, what you see us doing? Did you do Rachel, did you have you more? Want to or something? I'm oh. sorry. Was that a question? Oh, sorry. I lower my hand. Okay. Thank you. Did somebody else have something to say? No, I was just wondering how you want to move forward. Do you want to like have a motion to go back and reprioritize these by buckets or or do you, or are we going to do that now? Leah, what do you think? Uh, I would need some more information about the buckets. But I'm confused about that. Um, I see from these tallies, you already have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight essentially nine, unless you wanted to put kind of all the stormwater stuff together, uh, potentially 10 with the, the payment or the funding. 
So I, I, I don't know what you want to do. I, I, for me, it would be helpful to have them as a list instead of different buckets with different, I don't know what your bucket category would be. Um, if you want to talk about that a little bit more, then maybe I'll understand it. Sure. I mean, I was thinking that it would be like ABC, high priority, mid priority, low priority, right? It's just another filter to put on this existing list. Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, my video is off. Um, my internet at home is a little weird. So um, I, I like the idea of the buckets, but I would lean more towards like, I think the direction Matt was going in where it's different types, like the more planning based project, island wide project, and then like project, pro like, uh, I hate to say shovel ready, but like, you know, action oriented projects. I don't know. Um, in, in that light, I would maybe make a motion that we just decide today on the buckets or if we want to do that and then come back at the next meeting with like these put into the different categories. I, I don't know if that's a... <laughs> well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a motion. And if we take a second, then we can discuss it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to pass. So does there, is there a second on Sarah's motion? Are you motion? Are you seconding, Tim? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Doug, okay, Doug, did you have something to say? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I, th I think there's a there's a lot of frustration in in, in the fact that we don't have like a, a a ready to go project that we can tout as a big victory. But I think that's a function of the fact that you can't start a project if you don't have a plan. So I'm I'm looking at this list and I'm saying which of these could we start tomorrow with with tractors? Like let's put some bulldozers on site. And I don't know that there are any. So I guess I would not make a separate bucket of infrastructure or shovel ready projects until we know we have projects you can put in that bucket. And right now I don't know of those. Thanks. Okay, is there more discussion? No. I don't know. I, I just see the original list of these are just priorities. They don't have to be categorized all the way down to the most granular level. This is just what we're saying. These are the priorities. Um, I don't necessarily agree with putting them in different little groups and then prioritizing those. They still need to be a list of 10 or 12 that we're going to work on. Am I making sense? Um, we don't have to decide right away whether it's a project or if it's going to happen or if it can happen. But, you know, these are the, this is the list that we've been given the number, you know, the, the 10 things. And we've said here how important they are to us. So why don't we just, Sarah? Thanks. Um, I think for me personally, um, it might be helpful to, or, or it would be helpful to me to understand again what the value of the ranking is. I mean, I know in terms of like which projects we're going to pursue or which projects we're going to kind of, Leah can focus on looking for funding or whatever it is. But if there's a specific target for this particular list that would be useful to Leah, um, then I would want to hear that because then it helps me decide like whether they're in buckets or whether we just have a top 10 or, you know, like what what would help in terms of organizing this. Leah. Thanks, Peter. Um, there, I'll try to answer that. So for staff, like I, my list, Vince and I spoke about it. Um, and so what I, how I compiled that list was what it has the biggest risk right now. You know, do we know what the projections are, but, and those risks may change, um, which we know for some of these projects, like for example, the Sheep Pond Road one. Um, and so it's it's important to, to priorit prioritize them or have them one through 10 or whatever. So one, we know which projects are most important to focus on. And then two, how do we find funding for that? Um, you know, if we say this is, uh, Number one, this has been voted 
from crack as the priority project. When we go to Capcom, we can say that that may have a little bit of leverage, may not, I don't know. Um, but, you know, for, for over a year, you guys have been talking about prioritizing the priority projects. And so here we are. So um, if that answers it at all. I, I think that just tossing around the word project is going to confuse some people and make people Sorry, think. Sorry, recommendation. Okay. Priorities. Recommendation. Just priorities. The, the, the word project is making some people that speak different languages than we do think that we're actually going to have to do something right away or something. You know, we're just trying to say, we're just trying to prioritize these things. That's it. Go ahead, Matt. There are some uh, items here that were, were not included, aren't in the coastal resiliency, I, don't, I believe, because they are, you know, look, they're viewed as being underway, I'll, like Sakacha is underway. So we have, you know, so those, you know, those are still priority recommendations. They're underway. Where are they? You know, th those are going to be happen. And that's one. The other one point is, I think, uh, Oh, I'm losing it. You know, th those are on. Uh, you know, there, there are some items that are underway, and I had another point. It'll come back to me. Go to someone else, and I'll I'll come right back. Okay. Well, there is nobody else, so it's on. It's on oh. you. Oh, geez. Now you put. Now I'm gonna I'm fumble <laughs> it for it. Um. Uh, well, other? I mean, we're we're getting nowhere. We're we're trying to prioritize this thing. We're trying to break it up into pieces. Um, well, I'm still I'm still plugging for how we're going to pay for it. You know, I don't think that that needs to be, you know, uh, at least in the. Oh, the other point was Surfside wastewater. If there hadn't been a storm right before we had prioritized these, I think that would have been down in the one, two, three pile. But there was a storm and everyone read the newspaper, you know, and that is what's supposed to happen, you know, for sure. But I want to make it so I, but I think it's uh, the, the question is, how do we get to it? I think we I, I just I'm, I'm so so that that in that informed how we all looked at this because there was a recent issue. But that doesn't make some of the other things that are priorities and have been happening less important. Uh, they just weren't raised at that time, and I give. I'm going to give another uh, plug to Betterments. You know, we're figuring out regulations and modeling how we're going to pay for it, because uh, not everything is town going to be completely on the taxpayers. I hope. Thank you, Matt. Leah, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say that the list of. Um, recommendations are projects that have not been started yet. So like Matt had mentioned, a couple of them are underway. That's why they're not on this list. Um, and then I just, oh, it'll also be helpful, I think, for, for staff and also for CRAC. If, once that list is compiled, that we look at it every six months, every year, and see if any of those pri priorities have shifted. So like Matt had just mentioned, the wastewater treatment plant, you know, if there wasn't all of the couple storms that happened and the significant erosion, then maybe that would be lower on the list. So these are going to be shifting. Um, they're not static, obviously. The CRP is not static. So just to take that into consideration. Um, maybe since we're not getting anywhere, what I can do is the ones with the highest tallies, put those one through 10 or 12 or whatever. Um, and then at the next meeting, we can have a discussion about that. Sound good, everybody? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, okay, I don't think we need to vote for that. We all agree. Um, uh, all right. Okay, so are we now? Um, do we have, uh, are we going to take Vincent or are we going to do, uh, number nine, Leah? Uh, let's do number nine. Vince is still in his meeting. Okay. Initial discussion on coastal resiliency recommendations to be included 
in an effort to Harbor's action plan. Good silence. Okay. Well, um, being the duly uh, designated crack represent um, crack records, sorry, uh, Harbor Plan representative on crack. Um, right now, the Harbor Plan Update Committee is going through what the recommendations and goals will be within the plan. Um, so. You know, I think I say we engage them as 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 soon as we possibly can. The, the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board is now contributing recommendations uh, that will go into the plan, and 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 the committee is working through those. So, you know, this is a I guess it's another homework thing where um, we really think about how 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 best to contribute to the. To the harbor plan and that may require each of us to look at the harbor plan as it exists today the the 2009 harbor uh, nantucket and Madigan harbors action plan um, and then decide while wearing our crack goggles uh, what should go into it Go ahead, Jen. Thanks, Steve. Um, given the conversation we are just having, I wonder if one of the ways uh, we can contribute is to take our kind of recommendation priorities that are pulling together and highlight the ones that apply specifically to the Harbor Plan and pass that over to the group that's working. And we can see them what are the connections between what they're proposing as well. Um, so that's a document we already put together of recommendations, and I'm sure they've seen it, but taking it all that prioritization we are just working on uh, for projects, if that's useful to pass on to them. Yeah, I mean, right right now we're, we're Urban Harbors Institute is giving us, um, you know, the recommendations within the goals and that all came from from public input sessions that we had this summer and, and the online survey and and so you could say that right now the plan's being written. Now's our chance to say what, what we think goes in there and and there's you know everyone on this committee might have something to say that, that should go in there. So um, just keep in mind that the um, we're on different we're in different time zones. So the coastal resilience plan is looking decades ahead, whereas the harbor uh, the harbor actions plan is, you know, be a document for five to 10 years, and then there'll be another update. So, you know, how best to engage crack as we develop the plan, um, you know, we need to look forward and see which sort of maybe near term projects or whatever um, can be integrated into the plan, what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, I guess I think in terms of us kind of figuring out how, like, or making recommendations to what we can put into the harbor plan, I think I'd want a little bit either more guidance about the types of things or the the structure of what goes into the plan. Because I think at this stage, it, that's like a really broad ask, right? And so I think whether it's like projects or just things we want them to consider or, you know, I think um, I think I was at one of the very first meetings when their very first kickoff, which was that very broad, like, what are your concerns? We just want to hear everything. And so I think at this stage, um, if we're being asked to kind of come up with a list or something, I think it would be helpful to maybe have a little a little bit more targeted 
Um, the timeline does help. So in the next five to 10 years, what are the concerns? But I think it's really broad. And um, and part of it would be, I would just say, look at the CRP. Um, I don't know if it's something that you want, if there's a meeting of theirs that you want more of us to participate in, or is it like having some of the, the organizers of that meet with us I just I guess I just don't know what stage this is in and I know you're telling us they're kind of like getting recommendations but it's like what types of recommendations do they want projects do they want just things to consider do they want you know it's like it's it's almost too broad of an ask in my opinion I, I kind of need a little bit more guidance well maybe what I can do for the committee members uh, for our committee is to get you our draft matrix of um recommendations that we're working through now and then everyone can look at that and look at that through coastal resilience eyes and maybe that'll spark some some ideas does that sound like a good idea seeing some nodding heads you still yeah, have it's, yes it's, really, it's much more helpful to review something to kind of know what the direction that's already going in to make some recommendations or comments okay um, that's what I'll do then. I will I will get a hold of I'll email Kim Starbuck today and get her to, to send everybody a copy of what we've done so far. Um, and you can see how we're we're thinking. And then we can revisit this at the next meeting. Does that sound okay, Leah? Yep, that sounds fine. Okay. I think I think you were just hoping for like an initial discussion before urban harbors comes back right. to this meeting to discuss the questions so uh, but i think having what we're doing in front of everybody will you know i'm not really explaining it very well so um to see that um will help okay um so we uh is vincent ready i, I just got a text from him peter that we'll have to continue that agenda item to the next meeting. Okay. Because meeting is, is not going to be done in time. So I'm um, just seeing a vote for that. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll take a, a, a motion to continue the initial discussion on, um, no, I'm sorry, to continue um, update and discussion on bylaw and home rule petition for islands, coastal resilience districts by Vincent Murphy, Town of Nantucket Sustainability Programs Manager. So moved. Okay. Moved by Doug. Second mm -hmm. by Gary. Roll call vote. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Tim Brain. Aye. Doug Rose. Aye. Gary Beller. Aye. Ben Carberg. Aye. Jen, uh, Joanna Roach. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Abby Di Molina. Abby. Okay, chair votes aye. Okay, so you're on number ten. Public outreach ideas and strategies for committee mem from committee members. This is again um, my. Um, addition for every meeting anybody has any ideas they want to throw out um if you don't we've hopefully have an updated media scorecard by doug rose correct oh wait gary uh peter i just want to make the suggestion that since we have just agreed to uh, reschedule vince's uh presentation on the coastal resiliency districts uh for the next meeting I think that at that discussion, it might be um, worthwhile for us to also spend a little time talking about Matt Fee's uh, very important priority, which is for us to get more familiar with how the betterments would work. And, you know, to me, they're both two different ways that whether it's CRDs or betterments, this is the way a lot of the local projects will be funded. And as long as we're going to talk about the CRDs next meeting, 
maybe we ought to use that as an opportunity to talk a little bit about betterments to see. Uh, and in order to do that, we might need some help. I don't know if the, who who might be the one to uh, come to the meeting and talk about whether we need one of our lawyers or somebody else to talk about how the betterments work currently, because I know we've used them in the past. Some of us aren't that familiar with them, but it's to me, it's two sides of the coin. You, you know, whether it's a betterment or it's a CRD, this is how we're going to fund a lot of local projects. And maybe we could talk about it next meeting. Leah, does that sound like something we could hook up and get somebody here to it? Yeah, I'll reach out to the town manager and see if we can have um, someone from the legal team or some, if they can send me information and I can forward it to you all. Okay. But uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Great. Thanks, Gary. Tim, you had your hand up? Yeah, I was I was just going to agree with Gary. I think uh, it would certainly help me. So. Okay, excellent. It Matt. May not you may not need to be a lawyer. Sometimes they make it more more confusing than it even is. Uh, but Brian probably could do a great job. Brian Turbot. Whoever can help us out most is we, we choose. I agree. Okay, excellent, Gary. I'm sorry, not Gary. Um, Doug. Are you ready me to talk about um, scorecard? Yes. Yeah, I did not distribute it again this week, but um, it wouldn't be worth the paper it's on because it, it was a very light uh, past two weeks. We had one post um, uh, February 1st that was not reposted anywhere else that I could find. So it feels like we're in a little bit of a lull and um, probably need to do something to to reinvigorate uh, our, our partner organizations to to repost what we're, what we're doing. That's that's all I've got. We're at a total of 140,000 impressions. It's in good. week week 13. It's the middle of winter. Yeah. Matt, go Next ahead. Week is the slowest week of the year on island. Everyone leaves for a vacation, school vacation, and then it'll start to slowly build up after that. Yeah, so take and then, every, and then everyone hates each other. <laughs> I always hate everybody. I all hate everybody. I hate all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, I don't have to wait till February. These meetings are the highlight of my life. Yep. <laughs> I love being <laughs> Um Okay. Um, then we'll move on to approval of the minutes. And we don't have minutes. That's correct. Okay. New business committee and natural resources department reports from um, planning board, CONCOM, SHAB, Select Board Advisory Committee of Non-Voting Taxpayers and other committee members. Leah? Thanks, Peter. Um, well, we have a storm today. So high tide is around 3 p.m. Um, I'll be going downtown to check out all the flooding. They have forecasted um, that we'll have two to three feet of storm surge. There'll be minor flooding, which is considered less than one foot deep, um, to moderate flooding, which is one to three feet deep. Apparently, the seas are supposed to be pretty large, um, so there may be some erosion as well. And I'll report back at the next meeting how that went, um, and probably on social media as well. Awesome. Get your canoe. <laughs> Doug? Um, through you, Peter, I had a question for, um, for Tim about um, just an update on where CONCOM is as far as independent counsel. And, you know, I think they also are looking for uh, some kind of independent technical reviewer that can weigh in on on the uh, the NOI regarding uh, Sconset Beach. Do you know anything more about the status of those two things? And also one last thing, um, do you know what the deadline is for public uh, comment on the NOI? Thanks. Well, uh, I don't know the update on finding an, a, an attorney. I think we it's been approved, but we haven't gotten anybody. And the last discussion, there was a, an interest in tabling it because we didn't have an attorney, but that was defeated and we went ahead and had part one discussion. Part two discussion is, I believe, the 22nd. Um, and but I don't know if we'll have 
an attorney by then. I just have I haven't been updated uh, by anybody. So I know that, <clears throat> and I I guess this Thursday is this discussion of the regulations. I read in the so I read somewhere that there may be a vote, which was a surprise to me. So, um, <laughs> uh, but th then again, it, it's been a little bit mushy because we we keep putting it off to get further information. So in any case, there'll be further information about the regulation discussion at Thursday's meeting. Um, and SBPF should be the 22nd and there'll be a presentation sort of part two, um, but I don't have any updates on experts and lawyers. I can find out and let you know. Please do. Definitely. Okay. I'll find that up for you. Leah. I was just going to suggest too, I can send the conservation agent and our office administrators emails to you, Doug. Um, they do all the postings and know the deadlines and all of that. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, discussion of upcoming meet, meeting dates and topics. The next meeting is March 12th on Zoom. You guys look thrilled. Okay. So um, if there's nothing else, you all want to go out and do snow angels like I do. So I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Matt Fee, seconded by Doug Rose. Roll call vote. Um, Doug Rose. Aye. Uh, Rachel Freeman. Aye. Jim Brain. Aye. Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Ben Carberg. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Abby D. Molina. Okay. Uh, chair votes aye. See you all later. Have fun on vacation. I know I will. <laughs> <laughs>